voting? That, uh, yeah, Facebook Live. You can put it on here. Oh, not yet. It'll be on YouTube. Could you interview him? Uh, I mean, not interview him, but you, you know, we're going to do it just like the president. Wallale, Edwajebo, Kedebowa Inini. We uh, greet you today uh, and we welcome you today to our presentation here at the Museum of the Anti-Slavery Collective Resistance Museum. Uh, it is my divine pleasure to be here today and to be your host. And I'm going to take a minute to allow some of you to join us. So Wallale, 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 welcome. For those of you not of the Agala Kingdom, Wallale means welcome. Wallale means welcome. And we are happy to have you here today. Kero bo wa inini. Erwa jebo. Okay, so we're all practicing our Igala, and again, we're so excited, so happy to have you here <coughs> with us today. So what I would like to do at this time is to, uh, as you're coming in, as you're coming into our live, uh, we are once again at the museum here at 249 St. Philip Street. Those of you who are local in the Charleston area, if you'd like to join us, we are very socially distanced and we are encouraging the use of your mask, okay? All right, so with that being said, at this point I want to welcome our local and newly appointed ONU, uh, which is Brother Nazar Abir, and so we welcome him here today, okay? And the, uh, the greeting, It's my divine pleasure today to the people of Nigeria, the people of Charleston, the people throughout our listening audience and our viewing audience. And uh, we are here. I thank my Ufe Dojo uh, for uh, introducing me. Um, we are here with the Queen Mother, Queen Mother Ima Aliella. And so at this time we'll begin and uh, I'll start over here with uh, our pieces. I'm gonna go directly into it. The African Redemptive Struggle Museum chronicles the history of African people uh, and what we did in our quest for freedom. Uh, the Gullah, Igala people never stopped fighting, never stopped fighting, and our history did not begin with enslavement, so that we understand it didn't begin with enslavement, and the fact that we, uh, in ancient times, Gala meant free men, free people, and we fought to maintain that freedom. Um, and so I'm gonna go on and begin with certain pieces that demonstrate uh, who we were, who we are, and we're eternally grateful to have been brought back to a consciousness uh, of Igala people and Igala consciousness. So if you uh, join me. We want to begin <clears throat> with Ata Igala. Ata Igala is the king of the Igala people the king of the Igala people. You see the elephant. The elephant represents the might, the power, dignity, memory, long-term, long uh, all of the attributes of great people and a great king. This great king came to power uh, in 2013. And after uh, doing uh, his reign, he instituted a call to Igala people worldwide through our great ambassador, Ambassador Ayegbe Abdullahi, so that those who were removed, forcefully removed from the land, uh, could reconnect with our language, with our land, with our culture, 
and those things that made us great. Those things that our ancestors fought so greatly for. Because people say, you know, our ancestors fought for our right to vote. I, I respect them. They say we, vote, we, we fought for our right to go to schools and integrate and all of those things. But we fought to get back to our land, to our language, and our culture. That's why the Gullah people retain so much of our uh, African culture, and we didn't, we weren't sure what, what it was called. We just knew it was African. And so as we continue to, along this quest, this redemptive struggle, which is part of the name of the museum, the African Redemptive Struggle Museum, and a redemptive struggle is a struggle to free yourself from what distresses and harm you. It's not only free yourself, but free others for what distresses and harms us. So in that redemptive struggle, we fought for reconnection to our land, language, and culture. And so this great king sent forward a word in 2013 uh, for the people who have been removed, scattered to the four corners of Europe to reconnect with the Igala kingdom. And those of us who heard the voice, who heard the call, we return uh, first by reconnecting to our brothers and sisters worldwide, okay? Um, now, the Igala uh, king, not only when, when he put out that, re that call for us to return to our great power and to our people and our, and our land, um, that same year, the United Nations issued the same thing. They followed our great king's lead in issuing this uh, international decade of people of African descent. And so they followed his lead. But he, this great king uh, put the ambassador on that, that mission. And that ambassador, uh, Ambassador Abdullahi, is doing a great job in reconnecting, as you can see, those of us back to our land, our language, and our culture. So we acknowledge our great king. We acknowledge the ambassador. We acknowledge the prime minister. Um, and we acknowledge all those who are viewing with us today and by now, I'd like to uh, continue with uh, this presentation. So the great king, uh, Atta Igala, here, again, the elephant represents, it's an emblem that represents power and might of the people and of the king. In this uh, presentation, we need to understand that the Igala people migrated from northeastern Africa, from Egypt, the region uh, that, uh, that e modern-day Egypt is right now, Nubia, many of our great peoples migrated from that region. The Igbos say they migrated from, from that region. Uh, the, uh, many other people migrated from the region of Nubia, Kemet. This great king, this is Taharka. You see the emblem on his, on his crown. It's called a double Uraeus. This double Uraeus represents uh, rulership of Upper and Lower Egypt. This great king is written about in the book of Kings, Chronicle, and Isaiah in the Bible. And so when we see the image of our great kings, and we understand that those who lived in those regions, that's Africa. <laughs> it's not the Middle East. If somebody can show me the Middle East, then I'll ask them to show me the Middle West. <laughs> and there is no Middle East. So this African king, was so powerful when the Assyrians said that they were going to attack Jerusalem. They sent a letter to the Israel, Israelite kings to say that we're going to attack you and your God can't save you. And so when Taharqa got word of that, he sent word to the Assyrians that warned them if they attacked Jerusalem that he would send an army so vast until when the first man reaches them, the last man would not have left. So they held off the attack for about 20 years. And so in the biblical uh, um, version of it, it doesn't deal with years and things like that. that the Bible's, Bible's written in parables, symbols, metaphors, and similes. But it was a 20-year period that he held them off. Then they attacked. And when they attacked Jerusalem, Taharqa attacked them. In the biblical account, Taharqa and his army destroyed the Assyrians. He killed 185,000 of them. That's in the book of Chronicles and Kings. 185,000 of them. And they refer to him as the angel of the Lord. 
And so this is a great king. And uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier about the uh, Igala kingdom, the Igala kingdom traces its, its origin in Kemet, in Egypt. The Igala kingdom is the 10th dynasty. Taharqa was the 25th dynasty in Egypt. And so we see the African origin of royalty, of rulership, of power coming out of Kemet, ancient Egypt. So we begin here because we did not begin in enslavement. And a lot of people begin history with enslavement. And so from here, we were a very powerful kingdom. And there were many other powerful kingdoms, plural, throughout the world, in the African world, that is. So, going to the point where, from there, uh, and the reason why I always uh, want to connect and point out the ancient and not so ancient Igala connection to the Gullah people. We have so many similarities besides the language and besides the culture. For example, here you see uh, a painting that represents the Aboko Boat Festival in Ida, uh, Koji State, the capital of the Gala Kingdom. And what this represents is a festival that occurs annually in Koji. Now, the Mosquito Fleet is a group of African men in our history as Gullah people who, like these men, the Mosquito Fleet, they built their own boats, they build their own sails when they use sails, and they row out and go into the Atlantic Ocean and, br and bring back seafood to the Charleston and South Carolina area. And we had great boatmen. As a matter of fact, the first male carriers in colonial America, they were African boatmen. These were Gullah people. And so the other thing I want to um, note is that in the Igala language, words that begin with consonants, the I comes before the word. In other words, before the consonant. So if it's Peter, it's E. Peter. Or James is E. James. Or if it's Gullah, it's E. Gullah. But we dropped it in once we were taken from this land, and it became a uh, umbrella term for all the Africans that came whether you came from Gola, whether you were Kisi, whether you were uh, Dogon, whether you were Akan, they just say Gullah people. And so, personally, I had a DNA test done and it, and it traced my lineage all the way on my paternal side back to Koji. And so, um, there's so many Yoruba in the database of the University of Pennsylvania who did mine, um, and so, what they end up doing is lumping a lot of people as Yoruba. Now, I'm not going to get into the history of the Yoruba or anything like that because I don't, I don't even pretend to be a scholar as it comes to that, but sufficient to say that I determined, I learned that I was not Yoruba, and even the Yoruba that I know, they practice Ifa, and from what I understand, Ifa originates from Fa, which is to write. And so, when we were taken from the continent, there were people who said that we couldn't read or write. But in our very language, and in, 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 in some of the names of the Africans, writing was in the name. And so, I'm going to say this. The people who kidnapped us from the land, they really couldn't write, couldn't read, and still can't. I don't care if they got a PhD. And this is what I mean by that. When you see the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, all of that, all the way to Z, that didn't originate in England. <laughs> that didn't originate in France. France don't have a letter, a writing system. England doesn't have one either. So you don't speak American, you're speaking English. The English borrowed it from the Romans. So those are Roman uh, uh, letters and alphabets and, and they did not create it themselves. Now we have multiple writing systems. Fa means to write. Ifa is the people who write. And so we are writers 
we, we introduce writing to the world. And I'm gonna cover some of that as we, come on in big brother. Uh, I'm gonna introduce some of that as we continue on. And uh, so, as we continue, I'm gonna come over here to uh, a point in history where the battle, the quest for freedom, for the most part, became most intensified. And that is, in 1418, Pope Martin V issued a proclamation that sent Portugal and Spain against Africa. Portugal and Spain. And so, the Portuguese, right now, the majority of the, 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 the largest population of Africans outside of the continent of Africa is in Brazil. The Portuguese had that. Uh, and still, the people speak Portuguese. Um, Spain, uh, the, the Spain, the Spanish, who went to the island Hispaniola, they brought the first Africans uh, into these parts in chains to build the colony. Now, there are people who say, 16, 19, Jamestown, Virginia, the first Africans came, and, and uh, poor Africans, they had to wait till somebody give birth to Abraham Lincoln so we can get free. Well, that story is full of garbage. <laughs> somebody need to end that mess. Because when, it's thought, when, when, they, when they brought the Africans in, in 1526, the Africans got free that very month. So the narrative of us needing somebody to free us from Jamestown, Virginia is bull crap. You hear me? And somebody needs to stop that. <laughs> so search and research and research again because there are people with PhDs that can continue to take that narrative forth and that is not true. The Africans that came in 1526 from the island of Hispaniola with a magistrate who was a Spanish magistrate that attempted to build a colony at modern day Georgetown, South Carolina. His name was Lucas Vasquez alone. All right, some people call him Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, de Ayon. Okay, well, either way you call him, when he brought the Africans and, and attempted to build that colony, the Africans freed themselves that very month and continued to be free 93 years before Jamestown, Virginia. Now, the narrative of a people who came in and changed and got free, revolted and remained free, the, the scholars of that day never wanted other people to hear it, never wanted people to perpetuate that. Okay, but that's our history. Taking freedom, because why? As I said earlier, Gullah means free men, okay, in ancient times. And so, uh, even in, in ancient times coming on forward, it, it meant people who write. Among us was the Fa, the Ifa. Okay, so now, so when the brothers gained their freedom at Georgetown, South Carolina, Winya Bay, the, the region was called, or that the development was called, uh, San Miguel, the Gal Tepe. San Miguel, the Gal Tepe. Um, if you look up Lucas Vasquez alone, you can come up with a whole lot of information about it. But again, Georgetown, South Carolina, modern day Georgetown. So this piece represents what I call Gullah Sentinels. These are the people who got free that very year, took their freedom. Um, they didn't vote to get free, <laughs> okay? You can't vote your way out of this thing. You still can't vote your way out of this thing. So these brothers took their freedom by force, just like they were taken from the continent by force, okay? Now, Gullah Sentinels, they're on the beach looking towards the Atlantic Ocean which was at one time called the Ethiopian Ocean. Let's do some research. That's what time it is, okay? Brothers looking over the ocean. Why was it called Ethiopian Ocean? I'm glad you asked someone out there. And that's because <laughs> the entire continent at one time was called Ethiopia. The entire continent of Africa by Europeans, meaning the Greeks, because the Greeks came to Africa to be taught. We taught the Greeks. The Greeks taught the Romans. Nobody could teach the Europeans. The Anglos was just barbarians. They were run, they were first called Angles out of Germany. They were run out of Germany, out into an island of, England is an island, you know. 
And so they occupy that island. But they mastered warfare. And so from there, they took over the, the, the people of Wales. They dominated the people of Ireland. They dominated the people of Scotland. They, did, they mastered warfare in those places before they even knew there was Africans. So by the time they got to some Africans, they had already mastered fighting. Okay? So we got to understand, they didn't start with Africa. They started with the Wales. So when you hear the Prince of Wales, it's because they took over Wales. The Welsh people had their own language. They had their own government. They had their own everything. They, the Angles took it. So when you hear Anglo-Saxon, remember that originates from Angles out of Germany. Now, mention about Spain. Spain realized we better leave these people alone because they done wiped out our people who tried to build this, con this, uh, this colony at Winya Bay. And so they went back to uh, the island of Hispaniola and to Florida. So when Spain developed Florida, they were, they were so far away from, from their wealth and they didn't have enough manpower, they didn't have enough gold because they were running around all over the place looking for gold. <laughs> they couldn't find any gold. Only gold they could find was black gold Africans. So what they said was in 1693 now, they issued a proclamation that said, any African that makes it to Spanish territory will be given their freedom. We ain't gonna mess with y'all and try to put no chain to y'all no more, okay? So they said, we will, uh, as long as you take a Spanish name, convert to Catholicism, um, and, and, and pledge to, to defend Spain, meaning defend Florida, for a period of at least two years, you good with us, all right? So we were like, well, that's cool. So Africans began moving to Florida as we were being brought in to these uh, work camps that they call plantations. These plantations, we need to really understand, it's not a place that you should be, uh, you know, really just looking to, to move to and stuff. It's just, you know, there are people who, oh, I wanna, I live in so-and-so in -so plantation. And they say, you know, they conjugate their verbs and they start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they don't conjugate their verbs. But <laughs> these plantations, were places where they concentrated us in and forced us to work. If they did it in Russia, they'll call them concentration camps. So what's the difference between a concentration camp in Russia and one in America? Oh, one speaks English and one speaks Russian. Well, anyway, we need to rethink what we've learned about our history. And so this quest for freedom, which we never stop fighting, okay? The Gullah people never stop fighting. From the time we freed ourselves here, 1526, coming forward, 1739, this piece represents the Stoner Rebellion. Stoner Rebellion happened on a Sunday morning, 1739, in the uh, uh, British colony of Carolina, in the county uh, or the parish known as Charleston, and uh, out near about 20 miles south of Charleston, South Carolina. There were 25 African men who decided we had enough of this thing they call slavery, okay? Um, and they decided that they would take their freedom by storming the armory where the Anglo-Carolinians hid their weapons. And they would take the weapons and began freeing Africans along the Indian Trail that went from Carolina to Florida. That Indian Trail now is called Highway 17, U.S. Highway 17, running north and south. Um, and so they began at the what is now a place that we call Peter Miller's. There's a bridge there hmm? at the Stono, uh, <laughs> the Stono River. They Sorry. call it <laughs> Peter Miller because there's a man who had a, uh, I mean, you know, he was a great man. He had, had um, uh, a gas station, uh, many businesses right there, including a liquor store. You know, he had multiple businesses and it was a center for, for, for everything as I grew up. And so, but at that location in 1739, it was where the armory was kept, directly across from it. They stormed the armory, these men. Right here, I call this piece strategic planning. Because when we talk about Africans, most people don't think that we planned. We just, we, like, you know, they didn't give us credit for the things we actually did. We taught the Europeans. 
you know, we, we, we have to, again, rethink because this thing they call Southern hospitality. Southern hospitality, gullah style, is when you meet a stranger, you invite him for food, you offer him water, you offer her a uh, 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 refreshment or something. The, the Anglo uh, treatment for a stranger was to find a rope and hang him. What are you doing here? Uh, especially if the stranger is black or Native American. But with Native Americans, we, we adopted some of their language. They adopted some of ours. Some of their tradition, we still do now. Like barbecuing. Who doesn't barbecue? The European didn't know nothing about barbecue. He didn't know nothing about spices. When he found spices, <clears throat> that was the first time he ran off the war. The spice wars, Punic wars. They fought over spices. Cause they, they, when, they, when they tasted pepper and salt and, and other spices, it's like, I'm going to kill somebody for this. That's European. That, that's now. There's, so that's the difference between Southern hospitality, Gullah style, and Southern hospitality, Anglo-Carolinian style. Okay? So we have to take credit for Southern hospitality if you're talking about food. If you're talking about treatment, if you're talking about manners. So we taught the European manners. We taught them how to cook. Now, understand this. This isn't, you know, oh, that's harsh. This, he's so, why is he? That's truth. Truth is the, the greatest weapon in a freedom, freedom struggle. Truth is more powerful than a nuclear weapon. Because only the truth was prophesied to make you free. Nobody said, uh, uh, get a nuclear weapon and he shall make you free. And they ain't written in no, none of the holy books. <laughs> okay? Now, let me go back to this thing here. All right. So when these brothers began to free people along the way, just to show you how they were and the, and the, and the humanity of them, the people that treated them cruelly, that cut your foot off because you're trying to escape the, the concentration camp, or they would castrate men for what they say, looking eye, reckless eyeballing and all of this crazy stuff. As a matter of fact, they even named the disease. Uh, they call it drapetomania. Drapetomania, now, you, should, you can look it up. They said people who run away, suffering from a disease called drapetomania. Now, this is their doctors and high scientists. These are scholars. These are people who we should trust with our health. They said we were suffering from a disease called drapetomania, you know, because they must be suffering from something, running away from uh, as good as we treating them. Look up drapetomania. These were doctors in America. Anyway, these brothers began to free people along the way, and so the people that treat them harshly, they gave them justice. The people who were kind to them, they protected them. That's the history of people who were trying to escape. Still didn't just wipe out people because they could. Okay? Now, that is part of our tradition. If you have a kind person, you treat them kindly. That was foreign to you, to, to the Anglo-Carolinian. Foreign to them. And so, in order for us to actually make America great, we have to teach truth. We got to be about truth. And that's the only way where we can attain the highest possible um, attainment. That's the only way. Because, let's say, if I wanted to create the best medicine, but I can create, create substandard medicine if I keep a particular thing secret, okay? Well, um, we have to then make a choice. Which culture will we choose? Our own or the Anglo-Carolinian way, okay? And so uh, we have an obligation to do it our way, okay? That's the only way we can then heal people and stop practicing medicine. The reason why uh, medicine is still being practiced is because it's foreign to actually heal people. As a matter of fact, Dr. Sebi, many of us know him, Dr. Sebi was healing people of HIV. They arrested him for what? Practicing medicine without a license. How did he win his case? 
because he never diagnosed them with HIV. And when they went back and got tested and the doctor said, you don't have it anymore, he wasn't the one that told him you don't have it anymore. He just gave them the remedy, the recipe, the formula for healing. And it wasn't chemicals, it was nutraceuticals, meaning nutrients. There's a difference between nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals. Back to my, uh, my point over here. Uh, anyway, Stone of Rebellion, 1739, quest for freedom that we were successful. So successful when we got to Florida, we, we arrived at Florida about a year later because we spent some time with the Seminoles, not the Seminoles, the embassy. And once we got to, to, to St. Augustine, there were so many of us arriving, they said, hey, wait, y'all gonna build your own city. <laughs> we were like, no problem. So we built Fort Mose. We had a couple of forts. Fort Mose was one. The Negro Fort was the other. Now, the Negro Fort was the fort at Apalachicola, Florida, what they call now Tallahassee. We got that from the British, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. That's going to be your homework, okay? The Negro Fort, and there was a great battle at Negro Fort, and when, the, when, when a Andrew Jackson blew up the fort, he killed about 300 and something Africans um, and 25 Native Americans. So if you see the ratio of how many native, um, how many Africans were in Florida at the time, we had our own cities, our own free towns in Florida. And so we need to really look at what was it, you know, what were we pursuing? Were we looking to integrate so we could vote? Or were we looking at building independent communities? And every time we built an independent community, we excelled so greatly until the Europeans, sooner or later, they bomb or kill everybody in the town. Or at least try to, anyway. But we have a lot of incidences where they, where they have taken out everybody in the town. Speaking of that, Kwame Nodali. During the American Revolution, Savannah, Georgia, the British heard that these people over here declared they're going to be independent of Britain. They got taxation without representation. And the British said, wait a minute. The taxes in Jamaica is higher than the taxes in, in, in America. So how in the world, y'all got taxation without representation and, and it's so cruel, and y'all taxes less than most of the other colonies, okay? But, you know, why spoil a good story with the truth? <laughs> you know, that's the reason why taxation without representation was the one that went forth and it, and it grew legs, and that's what people still repeating. So, when the British heard that, they instituted a blockade from Maine all the way down to Florida. And so in Florida and um, uh, uh, Savannah, near Savannah, Tybee Island, Georgia, there was an island, Tybee Island, that had 200 men, women, and children, African men, women, and children, who had gained their freedom. They ran away from the plantation. They said, no more for us. When the Br British come in, we taking the ships and we going on a cruise forever. We ain't coming back, okay? And so when the when the South Carolina legislature learned that, the, uh, that these black men, women, and children were on Tybee Island, they said to the Georgia legislature, y'all gonna have to do something about that because y'all, the Georgia legislature had men to dress as Native Americans and they sneaked on the island and killed every man, woman, and child at Tybee Island. There's not a marker for that right now. But it's in the South Carolina legislative record what they did. I learned about it from British historians. So a lot of what has been hidden in plain sight, you can read about it in military archives, British records, because to the British, these, were, these guys were terrorists. George Washington, Nathan Hill, Patrick Henry, they were terrorists to the British. You know, they were nothing loyal about them. And during the American Revolution, there was two, there were three combatants. There was the British who were serving the king. There was the British who broke away from the king. So people tried to start thinking that George Washington and Ben Franklin, and ben Franklin all the guys were it was American. They were British. They still speak English. So do we. <laughs> okay? These were British people. 
that broke away from the king, but they were still British. And there were the Africans who was wanting to get free themselves. Kwame Odali, when the British came to Savannah, they were expecting to see these Africans who was at Tabi Island. They didn't see them. They didn't know what happened. They were like, wow, we were going to hook up with them and we were going to fight. They didn't see them, so they kept upriver, and Savannah was so well defended by the Anglo-Georgians until they kept all the way upriver to avoid the cannons that were mounted uh, waiting for the British ships to come in. So Kwame Odali saw what happened, and he went downriver to the British. And he went to the British and said, I saw what happened. And if you guys want to get in, I know a, 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 another route that you can take and come in here. So he took the British on a circuitous route around Savannah and came up behind the defenses. And the British were able to take Savannah, Augusta, and then they came to Charleston and took Charleston. Now, our quest was for freedom. That's the whole gist of this whole lecture today, is to show you how Kwame Odali was a brother who was dedicated to freeing himself. He wasn't thinking about no taxation without representation. We had taxation without representation, not George Washington, okay? And we still got taxation without representation. No, I, I've been to the state capitol with the state senator, and I took students there for them to tell us how they make these laws. And this particular uh, senator showed us that you, you cannot make a law just for African people unless you get some of the Anglo-Carolinian uh, legislators to sign on. As a matter of fact, uh, it's better if they uh, push the legislation because no Africans by themselves can actually pass a law. So if we need a law, we can't get it without the Anglo-Carolinian saying, you're going to have it. So we still got taxation without representation. But that's, that's not what this lecture is about. This is something else. So um, we're dealing with freedom and who fought for it and who said, I ain't fighting for y'all to vote. Kwame Odali didn't do what he did for us to vote. I ain't telling you not to vote, but I'm telling you right now, some of our ancestors didn't fight for us to vote for nothing. They fought for us to rule. And so that's why it's so important that when we heard the call of the Atta Igala, and he said he's calling us back to the place that was that we were stolen from, that we were kidnapped from, okay? That's very important. Now, people who don't like that, I'm gonna ask them, oh, do you don't like the fact that the, the Jewish people are occupying a land that they claim that their ancestors um, um, came from? Because if you oppose me and my hearing the call of a king, <clears throat> then you need to reevaluate that. <laughs> not like not like I care, but I'm just saying you'll need to reevaluate it. Because you might need to be listening for a king. I will I learned some time ago, and the Queen Mother can be uh, uh, she can testify to that. We learned that the ear is the most important organ on your body. Because if you don't hear, <laughs> something bad could happen to you. You be riding around, you got your ear earplugs on, and you walking on the train track and get nailed because you ain't listening. You walking around uh, with, with, with the stuff on your ears and walking in traffic, you can get hit. Or you, uh, or the king can call you and you're not here, and you can get hit by circumstances. You know, So when you hear certain things, it could end your curses and increase your blessings. So you should be listening for certain things and not just looking for it. Now, <clears throat> so Kwame Odali led the British on that quest, and many of us know of the, the church in Savannah uh, that was the first African church, with an African population back in the 1700s. And the church is still there now, and there's much talk about it, and how there's markings on the, the benches in there, and there's certain, uh, there's, there's markings on the floor or there's areas in the floor where you can see that the people uh, needed ventilation because they were under the building, but they don't deal with where did they go. That population, that church congregation left with the British. Some of them repatriated the continent. So most people talking about the first African church and then the Haitians came and the Haitians helped us fight. No, the Haitians fought us. We need to really know our history. 
Because when those Haitians came, they were fighting for George Washington and for the American cause. They weren't fighting for the African cause. But now when they went back to Haiti, they fought for the Haitian cause, okay? And they freed themselves and created the first uh, free, in the, well, second, because the, the first one was actually um, in South America, um, Palmeiras. And that's a whole other story. So, as they left this region and went into the, uh, with the British, now I understand when the British took siege of Charleston, a number of, of our people, I mean 25,000 of our people actually left South Car the Charleston area, South Carolina, at the end of the American Revolution. And these brothers, these brothers, the Black Brigade, the Royal Ethiopian Regiment, these men went to the British side in order to get weapons, in order to get free, in order to repatriate Africa. Not to integrate with the British, not to integrate in America, but to return to their land. Isaac Anderson, Boston King, Cato Perkins, and John Kaisel, these were men, and that's what these reflect, these men who fought for freedom, okay? <clears throat> these men fought in order that we could return to the land. They left from America, went into Canada with the British, and from Canada, many of them went into what is now Sierra Leone, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and actually began uh, the, um, the, the, is to establish their own government. And I don't have the image here, but Isaac Anderson was the brother there were four men, the names that I just called, Boston King, John Cazell, Isaac Anderson, and Cato Perkins. These men were from Charleston. These were Gullah men. And they fought for their freedom, not America's freedom, not for Britain's freedom, but for the Africans who were the only one in the fight who was not free. The American Revolution, when people talk about, you know, we, did, we fighting for freedom. The only one fighting for freedom were the Africans. So when these brothers fought and they went to Canada and got to Canada and people were more racist in Canada than the ones here, and they sent word to the king of England, say, hey, send them boats back. We need to go to Africa. It's too cold up here anyway. So when they end up going back to Sierra Leone, uh, and from there, they decided that they were going to control this colony. But the British said, no, 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 this is a British colony. So Isaac Anderson went to the Sherbo chief to get an army to run the British out. So the British didn't even resist him. The British sent for 500 Jamaican soldiers who quickly hunted him down and executed him on behalf of the British. But we recognize Isaac Anderson as a brother, a Gullah brother, a Gullah man who fought for his freedom and gained his freedom, and at least he died an African in Africa. So we'll continue over here. I want to uh, go to my, one of my favorite pieces, which is Shields Green. This brother, Shields Green, in 1853, here in Charleston, South Carolina, he was on one of these work camps, and they, he was a boss on that work camp. And when the owner of the plantation lost it in a, in a, in a, in a bet. Um, he was gambling and he lost the plantation. And it changed hands into some, some cruel anglo Carolinians. Uh, what ended up happening is the, at, at some point, they whipped Shields Green. And Shields Green, he dealt with it, he said, okay, um, I understand. It wasn't something he was accustomed to because he was acting like a boss there. And, but with this new ownership, that's one of the things he had to deal with. So when they whipped his son, that's when he snapped. And he killed the plantation owner and a couple other men who were with him. And so he fled from Charleston and when he got to Washington, D.C., and met with Frederick Douglass. 
you know, Frederick Douglass making all these speeches, heretofore and evermore, henceforth, hither. She was reason, man, I'm from the Chuck, and I got time for that. I'm, it's time to fight. It ain't time to talk. <laughs> when it's time to talk, talk. When it's time to fight, fight. So uh, Shields Green left Washington and went up to West Virginia and got with John Brown. You know John Brown of uh, Harper's Ferry fame? Now John Brown was a white man, he was free, but he believed in people being free. And he put his money where his mouth was, and he said, man, I'm with you brothers. So Shields Green, and the, what I didn't uh, uh, mention, Shields Green was called the emperor because this brother was from royalty. And the whites knew this. That's why when the, when the plantation hand changed, they were like, oh yeah, you royalty, huh? And so the, 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 the first plantation owner, they understood and they treated him as royal. But the second one, that's when they, you know, it was like, oh, I'm a, you're gonna treat, be treated just like everybody else. But they called him the emperor and there's a movie about him. It's called The Emperor, Shields Green. Now, Shields Green, John Brown, Dangerfield Newby, and others, they, they went and not only did they storm the armory at Harper's Ferry, take weapons, and fought for the United States government. See, that, that story ain't told because they keep talking about John Brown, John Brown, John Brown. But they fought the U.S. government. And this was the spark that started the Civil War. This brother, the, the, the raid at Harper's Ferry had to make them think, man, if, if we keep this up, these black folks are going to, you know, they're going to probably, you know, all of them are going to probably be like this. He might reproduce, you know. And so we need to, like I say, make a careful investigation of, of our history. Um, you know, there's a chair over there if you want to. I'll just make chair over there. Okay. So, so um, you know, we got to make a careful investigation of our history. You've got many great men like, like, like Shield Green, Shield Green, and Boston King, and even Dangerfield Newby, which he was from, from the New York region up north. Um, so, I, I, I needed to, you know, really touch upon Shields Green, and uh, I'm going to skip some of this because, you know, we were forced to make brick. This brick, when, you, when we see some of these older buildings in Charleston and some of these older colonial towns, not only did we build the, the, the brick structures, but we built the brick before we built the building, you know? So understand, when we talk about Wakanda, that's imaginary, okay? That's an imaginary kingdom. Um, and we, we got so much pride in something that's, that's imaginary, you see? But Igala, that's a kingdom that is real. There are other kingdoms that are real. And so how can we be so dedicated to a, an imaginary uh, kingdom and not seek to unify with a real one? That's been our problem, uh, to, to connect up with imaginary stuff and don't investigate it. It don't take no investigation to know that Wakanda is, is imaginary. But, but that zeal, you know, to, to, to purchase all of that stuff, Wakanda and um, Avatar, those movies made so much money that we could have used to build a nation. That's what I'm saying here. We could have built a doggone nation. We don't have to march for nothing. If you look at how much money we spend on some of these movies, that's what I'm saying. Some of the some of the the, the iconic clothing, some of the headgear, all this other stuff, shoes, cereal. <laughs> they got it on the cereal box. All of this stuff. If you look at how much we spend on that stuff, because we become dedicated to Wakanda, we become dedicated to the Steelers Nation. The Cowboys Nation. But the nation you got stolen from, no dedication. You'd be like, I don't know about nothing but them Africans. As you as African as can be. When you do your DNA, doesn't say Steelers, <laughs> Cowboys. No. Okay? That's what I'm saying. There's so much, so much zeal. To the point where you paint your car, Pittsburgh Steelers, you riding down the street and advertising the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're paying somebody a million dollars for, for, for the same thing you're doing on the billboard, but you're doing it free. <laughs> and they're talking about, I need stimulus money. You are the stimulus money. That's what I'm saying. So we need to make a careful investigation of these things. And so uh, I'm going to just touch on a few more. Because, again, all of these images just testify to the fact that we never stop fighting. 
And so I started with 1418, uh, with Pope Martin V, who sent Portugal and Spain against us. Spain controlled Florida for a long time. These brothers here, this brother was in Florida when it was under Spanish control. So then when Spain sold Florida, you know, just like, uh, I'm going to just sell it, you know, we don't need this no more. They just sold Florida to America. And so the, so, the, so the black towns there were black people, we had a choice. Some of us went to Cuba. Some of us went to, to uh, uh, other areas in the Caribbean. And this brother, he's known for, they didn't leave. They didn't go to Cuba. They stayed, they said, we're going to fight. So as the, the Americans began to filter into uh, Florida and take more control of Florida after 1821, under the Adams Owners Treaty, uh, his name is, a they call him Negro Abraham. He was the leader of the Seminoles. But when they went to Washington to negotiate freedom for natives and Africans, they would not receive him as a leader of the Seminole. They received him as the interpreter for the Indians, okay? But in, the, in their archives, June the 15th, 1837, the Army and Navy Chronicle published the, art, the following extract from a letter received from a Euro-American officer fighting against the Gullah and Seminole Confederation. Now, you don't hear those kind of terms when they talk about, about the Seminole War, because they call it the Indian War. But the Seminole, the first, second, and third Seminole War was not an Indian war. According to their, own, to their own general, it was an Indian, I mean, it was a Negro war. Now, I don't know who Negroes are, but these were Gullah people. They say, we have a perfect Talleyrand. Now, Talleyrand was a diplomat in Europe. And so they compared him to the, the highest diplomat in Europe. This man, they compared him to a European diplomat, Abraham. They said, we have a perfect Talleyrand of the savage court in Florida, in the person of a Seminole Negro called Abraham, who is sometimes dignified with the title prophet. He is the prime minister and privy counselor of Micanopy. Now, Micanopy was the one they recognized as the leader of all the Seminoles. Now, Micanopy was almost 108. Uh, not quite, but he was real old, all right? And so, uh, said, and he was, and, and passed through his master, meaning Abraham through Micanopy, who is somewhat imbecile, said Micanopy now is imbecile, and because Micanopy is imbecile, stupid, old, can't think for himself, all right, he ruled all the councils and actions of the Indians in the region. He was the leader of, of all of them, the Black and Red Federation. But even in their own, you know, when they acknowledged that he was, you know, a, a, a leader of all of them, and he, he doing it through Micanopy, he using Micanopy. But this is what they, how they describe him. Say so he's a... Uh, Abraham is a non-committal man with a countenance, a face you cannot read, okay, which none can read. A person erect and active and in stature over six feet. He was a principal agent in bringing about the peace, having been a commander of the Negroes. Uh, during the war, and an enemy by no means to be despised. Now, this is, this is complimentary of a brother who they just kind of, you know, want to diss. They don't want to accept him as a leader, as a ruler. As a matter of fact, when they took the, uh, you know, Abraham went with the, the native, the Seminoles to, uh, to Washington to, to uh, negotiate peace. And when they took the pictures, they made him stand behind the Native Americans, you know, when in fact he was the leader. They didn't want him sitting amongst them so he stood behind them. And what we see in this dress right here, okay, that's similar to the Hausa dress, headdress. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to point out 
that many of the Hausa dress like this. Now, I'm, I'm not native to, to Nigeria. There may be other people who dress like that, but this is different from how the Seminoles tied their headdress. Theirs was just kind of round like this, but this is how Abraham wore his. Um, so, there's, it says so much more about him, but I, um, I'm gonna touch on Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was 22 years old when she began fighting for freedom. 22. When the war was over, Harriet was in her early 40s. So I don't know who the old lady is that be running through the woods with the people with the guns. Maybe y'all know. I don't know who that was, because Harriet Tubman wasn't no old lady running around in the woods with no damn gun. <laughs> we have to make a careful investigation of our history, because you know, these pictures of Harriet running in the woods with people is so bogus, it don't make any sense. In her latter years, she helped to fight for the right to vote in America. She fought, helped fight for women's suffrage. Susan B. Anthony and people reached out for her for information and for guidance and, and wisdom. That's what she was doing. Not running in the woods with a gun talking about, follow me and all this, I'm going to shoot you if you don't come with me. That's bogus. And we've been following bogus bull crap and um, um, so-called scholars and whatever else for so long. We need to investigate things or get with somebody who know how to do it. That's what I'm saying. So Harriet Tubman, this image references June 1st and 2nd, 1862, when she liberated 750 people in one operation in Beaufort, South Carolina. Harriet Tubman was more than a conductor in the Underground Railroad. You know, people talk about that because then you have to get these images of, of um, you know, Puritans helping us along the way and be hiding under their houses. Har Harriet didn't be hiding under nobody's house. Harriet came down here and she, she was packing just like this here. And she got the union ship to help get people out of here. And she was here for about three years before the union came and used the intelligence that she gained to help accomplish what they accomplished. Now, the European has this strange thing. When the Union came, they was like, I can't believe y'all going to them Union, them, them Yankees, and, and leaving us as good as we were treating y'all. <laughs> you know, as good as we were treating y'all. And, and understand now, history keep repeating itself. When the British came, and we used the British ship to get the heck out of here, I can't believe y'all. And so a lot of the atrocities that we know about and hear about in history always is after or is worse when we leave with whatever bus, truck, plane, or whatever we can get out of here on, then whoever's left, they really take a toll on you, okay? And they're still mad. And the problem with the Civil War is because at the end of the Civil War, all of the generals who fought against America and us got statues and streets named after them and cities named after them. If they don't have Greensboro and Greenville and Green whatever, and then there's Forest Acres, Forest Landing, Forest, Forest, Forest for Nathan Bedford Forest. Just so many of these people are named after, some, so many of these places are named after people, even if they take the statues down. And, and let, let's get it straight. I'm not for taking statues down. I'm for putting statues up. I paint these people because y'all who know how to make statues ain't making no statues to them. So I got to paint them. So instead of putting the energy into taking these people's statues down, we need to put some statues up so we will know about Abraham who went to Washington and to get freedom for all our people. And, and, and I'm sure some people just hearing this for the first time right now never heard of him. Or oh, and I cannot go past John Horse without mentioning Juan Caballo, also known as John Horse. John Horse is such a great man. I, it's too much to even tell. Just know that he's great. Do your homework. Learn about John Horse. Because John Horse is a bad man. He led the Seminoles from Florida to Oklahoma. From Oklahoma to Texas. From Texas to Mexico. And then when he got to Mexico, then uh, he, the, the governor of Mexico said, or the, the president of Mexico said, hey, we need you to defend our northern border because them Comanches keep coming in here conducting raids. So John said, don't worry about him, I got him. Now, if you want to know what John did, 
Clint Eastwood, in his movie, The Outlaw Josie Wales. When you see Clint walk, uh, ride his horse into the camp of the Comanches and he meets with 10 bears, that's what John Horse did. So when I saw The Outlaw Josie Wales, I realized in that movie as the story was being told that Clint Eastwood is a great historian and the Native American, um, the, the, the Native American in the movie as he starts telling the story, he's telling the story of the Gullah people. And, and, he, and he said, my name is Lone Wadi and blah, 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 and all of this stuff. And he talked about himself and John Jumper. John Jumper was an was a African chief with the Seminole. So he's, he's telling our story, and we don't recognize it because, you know, I mean, I, it's not like this. I'm not a genius. I just learned this maybe about five, six years, maybe, no, probably about 10 years ago. But I'm 59. I'll be 60 this year, okay? So if it took me this long to learn, <laughs> you understand? This is stuff that we have to have into our system of doing things. We got to know what we did in order to, to, to even stand on the, foot, on, the, on the shoulders of a John Horse. John Horse did so much. The patch on the Special Forces uniform, the patch, is after these brothers. The U.S. Army Special Forces patch with, that, with, that, with the arrows, the cross arrows. They, John Horse formed the um, Seminole Negro Indian Scouts. They were the first decorated soldiers in the history of America. Mm. These brothers. So, this is before the Buffalo Soldiers. Who are the Buffalo Soldiers? They came after these brothers fought for us and went around and started fighting the Native Americans who was helping us. Buffalo Soldiers. So they got, they got turned the name Buffalo Soldiers for their bravery and, and power and all the stuff that they were doing killing people that was helping us. Enough said about that. I'm gonna go to this right here and two more pieces. I, I'm gonna keep it up with the time so somebody's gonna have to help me because, 12.10? Um, All right, I'm gonna just cover a, a, about 10 more minutes of this. This piece reflects the the, the uh, Gullah Maroons. The term refers to people who live away from the plantation. This is doing slavery when, when there were black folks on these work camps, these plantations. They were, they fled from the plantations and they had colonies in the marsh, in the woods, and various places. As a matter of fact, South Carolina had more Maroons than any other colonies in, the, in British colonial America. Now, these are brothers that are fierce. Uh, they usually put their colonies in swamps because it was easier to defend a colony that's in the swamp. And like an African man can do, and not Tarzan, you know, they lived in harmony with the animals, even the mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes defended them, the alligators defended them. So they were able to uh, relatively live uh, without worry about white militias coming in because they were afraid of mosquitoes, they were afraid of, they were afraid of them. Um, and so we maintained those colonies for a long time. And so anyway, the term uh, Gullah um, Maroon, we need to be aware of the fact that not only were there Africans on, on plantations, but there were Africans in these colonies who were, who were not enslaved by anybody. And some actually you know, started out enslaved, but once they got to these colonies, they, they maintained their freedom. This piece is very important in that it, this is called the Hamburg Massacre. The Hamburg Massacre occurred in 1876, Hamburg, South Carolina. If you try to find it on a map, you won't, because Hamburg is gone. The Anglo-Carolinians wiped out the whole town. That summer, it was called the Bloody Summer, 1876. They killed over 130-something people, not just Hamburg, but in Ellington and other towns in that region. 
There's new Ellington. I used to pass it all the time going to, uh, um, to Augusta, to Port Gordon. And I would always see the sign say New Ellington. And it came to my mind, where is Ellington? How come there's new and there's not an old one? <laughs> All right, the old one was destroyed. And when they rebuilt the town, it was called New Ellington. But Hamburg, there were, right in 1876, during what's called Reconstruction, at the end of the, of the Civil War, uh, there was a time when African men and women, at least the men, were in government. And we had more representatives and things like that at that time. Um, and so 10 years into Reconstruction, the Anglo-Carolinians said, we're going to take our country back. Okay? So they formed these militias, and they wore red shirts. They were called the red shirts. Okay? Red shirts were, were um, commanded by Pitchfork Ben Tillman. Pitchfork Ben Tillman. Now, Ben Tillman led them in killing all these people that whole summer. One person who we killed was a senator, a black state senator, who was also a preacher and was on his knees begging not to be killed when they killed him. And the reason why I mention all of that is because if they can kill 130-something people and among them a state senator who is a preacher, and we not know about the Hamburg massacre, and the town is gone, then it's only a matter of time before people forget about Emmanuel. Okay? Emmanuel was nine. This was 130. Emmanuel had a, a representative. They had a representative. Emmanuel is here. This town is gone. The last thing that was left from this town was the train depot. And they moved that a few years ago and put that in a field someplace down there. I saw it when riding through a place I was going to visit my sister who was at a, 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 a still care facility and there was nothing but cotton fields and the thing was way out away from, this, from the roadway and it was just a piece of the building that was the train depot. They, they you know, it's gone. So the fight for freedom was constant and is still going. The fact that I'm reconnecting with my family in the continent and I'm just now learning some of my language okay the HBCUs have been around for a long time and not one of them teach a language that was taken from us not one of them has connected up with with a, a people who says well we still retain our language and we want to speak it in the manner that we spoke it before the European came it was only Beata Agala who did it and that's why I say the things that I'm saying about this great kingdom and about our ambassador, about our prime minister, about our brothers and sisters. We are in Cuba. Uh, a brother in Cuba uh, reached out for me just recently. Um, and Brazil. I give greetings to our brothers and sisters in Brazil. We in a brother in, um, was that, uh, Chicago. A brother in Chicago. You know, greetings. And so now go to all Igala, wherever you are. This is our day, and our day is not just 24 hours. Our day should be at least a 1,000 years, and we need to keep the sun up in this day as we continue to reconnect at the call of this great king and our great kingdom, and we keep greeting each other with now go, now go, now go, and we keep saying the great things that, the, you know, our, our, our great language sounds so sweet I don't know uh, uh, how to speak it fluently, but soon we will be speaking fluently, you see. So with that, I'm going to touch on two more pieces. One is this piece. This reflects the turmoil, the madness. Last summer, so much, and over the last few years, so much killing in America of our people. And, and so throughout America, you see a brother confronting the forces who were allied, uh, uh, allied against them. You see a, a sister right here with her fist raised. This sister, a very powerful picture where she's coming in peace and they're coming in force. And so uh, I painted this just to touch on some prophetic things that we should consider. 
It says, when they were the minority of little significance, kidnapped and sold to their enemies, wandering from nation to nation, state to state, he allowed no one to oppress them without reciprocity, saying, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. That's Psalms 105, 12 to 15. Here it says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. A lot of the things that you see occurring is because spiritual forces on our side are intervening on our behalf. And so when you see the turmoil and you see the confusion, um, it's not time to jump in the midst of that confusion. It's time to step back and reconnect with yourself. And that's what we are doing. We're so great. We're so greatly blessed. You know, we had, as Marcus Garvey once said, he said, where's our king? Our, our, he said, where's our king? Our men of big affairs. He said, he looked around and didn't see any. So he said, I, I decided I will be that. And so we are blessed now. There is a king that has called us to ourselves. We have a queen mother in our midst to a model for our young daughters and young women to learn from, to pattern their, 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 their selves after. She's a prototype. She's been fighting and teaching for years. And so we have wisdom in our midst. <clears throat> so it's, it's a new day. We need to rethink those lessons that were given to us that was harmful to us. People who told us we couldn't write. We have Omar Ibn Said. In this image, you see. Omar Ibn Said, and you see the traces of writing behind him. He was captured on the continent, sold into slavery, and when he arrived in Charleston, he took off and ran after he stayed a period of time because he said that the, the plantation owner was so cruel. And he ended up in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He didn't have any papers on him, he didn't speak English, so they threw him into jail. So when they threw him in jail, he picked up a, 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 a stick, as you see in his hand up here, and he started writing on the wall. And he wrote out a whole dissertation on dominion. And he said, no man has dominion over men. Only God has dominion over men. And he said to the wicked ones, he said, and when you meet your demise, when you die, and just before they throw you into a pit of fire, they will ask, did no one warn you that this was coming to you? And you will say, a warner did come, but we didn't believe. And at that time, they're going to throw him, throw them into the pit of fire. And he said, you will hear the, the, the sucking sound of the fire bringing them in. This is what he wrote. Now his writings is his writings are in um, Yale. His writings are in the University of North Carolina. Uh, Omar Ibn Ibn Said S A I D. Look him up. Uh, that's how we wrote <clears throat> in that day. We have multiple writing systems. Remember, Fa Ifa, the people who write. We are they. They are us. So with that, uh, I'm going to go to a, a set where we could have our ambassador to address on Zoom or anything like that. Or, or on uh, Messenger. Oh, are we set for that? Ambassador, if you want to, um, I saw where he joined the Zoom. Uh, thank you. Uh, So I think at this point what we're going to do is transition over to the Zoom. Um, 
So for those of you who are on right now, who are on the live, uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna, we probably just stay on live. You can stay on live and, and you can co connect to the Zoom. I've emailed it to you. Oh. Um, Ambassador, I also, well, he's on, so you can connect on to the Zoom. So uh, here's our Queen Mother while our only gets onto the Zoom. Uh, and Sister Angela, God bless you. She's been really, um, we have a lot of greetings here from the motherland. Sister Angela says, greetings Queen Mother. Uh, Brother Ami, Stephen, uh, they're greeting you. And um, yes, the ambassador is as well. We thank you all. Sister Autumn Thompson here locally. We appreciate all of you on today. I don't want to get to calling names because I don't want to leave anybody out. But as Brother Nazar is getting onto the Zoom, um, we also have, uh, Brother, you want to greet the uh, friends in Nigeria? Uh, would you like to just say hi? Our brother over there see, being quiet uh, with the hat on. What's his name? Ramon. Brother Ramon. Brother Ramon is saying hi and greeting. You know, okay. Well, we appreciate you. Yes. My daughter is also being another, um, <laughs> this is my daughter, Essence. Essence is being uh, another camera person <laughs> as well. And uh, she certainly uh, is looking prin princessly today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I just you. made up a word, princessly. <laughs> so anyway, we're also gonna, uh, we're also going to uh, present her with her letter of reconnection. Thanks to you, Ambassador Ayegba. So once we do that, but what the ambassador would like to do is to say, um, you know, to address anything that anyone may have any questions in, or anything like that, the ambassador would like to um, to do that uh, via the Zoom. So we're gonna I gotta make send it to my work thank room, you, I guess. I don't, I'm not seeing it. You said it, it was emailed? I emailed it to your work. To my work? I just uh, I enjoyed it on behalf of the okay. I Ramon, thank enjoyed you. it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank All right. You. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you so much. Bear with us, everyone. Thank you so much for bearing with us. We appreciate you. I don't have anything for yesterday. Oh, no. It's 11 o'clock. Well, oh, what was We also talked about doing it on Zoom, I mean on Messenger. Like, uh, so let him speak. Well, you want to call him? Let's see. No, it's not mine. I ain't got enough charge for it. Let me see. I'll call him. And what are we doing then? So she still got folks on. On a uh, social live? Hmm.
now look and see Buckland. You know what? She's a sweet lady. This kid better shut up. That's one of the things about Nigeria and some of the other um, African countries. Uh, Britain still controls the communication system of, of the places that it was. Trying to get it on Zoom over here, and it's still saying that waiting for the host to start the meeting. It's, it's waiting for you to let me in on Zoom. Maybe not. That's mine. Well, I think it's too. Oh, he's on. Well, we right. Can leave I thought it that we way. was gonna um, go on Zoom, so we're, yeah, we're gonna do this on way. Facebook. This is fine. I okay. This will work. Okay. So we, we're good. No, 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 no. no. We're, we're we're fine right now, and um, you you're on live, Ambassador. So, uh, so you you got them? At this at this at this time, uh, we, we we want to start mine up again on the phone. Okay. Do you have? Are, are we ready? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, at this time, we want to. Uh, uh, present to you, as I shared with, with everyone earlier, our great ambassador, uh, Ambassador Ayegba Abdullahi, who has been instrumental in calling all of the Igala people worldwide to the, the voice of the king. And so at this time, let us uh, receive the great ambassador. Uh, Lady Megala. Yashi. 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 Yashi.
some words from here that you are still using uh, till then. We have many Igala vocabularies that people are still using for them for the sake of time and network interruption. For instance, elder or father is data. I don't know how you pronounce it there or how it has been changed to. In Buladia, in Igala also, we have is data. Then we have I like I am. So in Bula is who like I have is who have. So in Igala also is who have. That is the same Igala word that your vocabulary that your ancestors took from here. Like he again, he, she, or it. Which we will call he. In Igala, they say he, like he's here. He's here. We say, okay, he did, he did. So he, or his, or it, is the same as he in Igala. Here. So, like it, you will say nyam or so, in Igala, we also say Yamu, Yamu. Then we have, uh, like, the English word correct. These are my research or investigations which I have done from the internet. They may not be correctly, or may not be all correct, but I'm still working for that. These are the few ones I was able to get anyway. Mm -hmm. So, correct or exactly in your own is Dede, okay, or Dede. So in Igala is I did it. Exactly. Correct. I did it. So then me in English. So in your own, from what I've seen in Bula, is me. Why in uh, Igala is for me? Me. Okay? Then we have witchcraft in English. And according to what I have found in your own, is uh, Josu or Josu. So in Igala is Osu. Then to gather something or to find something. What I have found in your own is Kome. Why in Igala? I don't know how you pronounce it anyway. Why in Igala is Koma? So we also have something like it's available in English. It's available. In Guladia is Ide. Or Ide. So, why in Igala is Ide? It's available. Ide. Is it available? I say yes. Ide. So, these are some few ones I want to brief you that I want to tell you that you are still retaining this Igala was taken from here by your ancestors. Of course, there must be evidence, just like our migration from ancient Egypt. We have many words we are sharing with ancient Egypt today. Like Omi, which is water, snake, which is Ejo, okay, which is here. All these, even Ata, are the same ancient Egyptian words that we are still using in Igala land today. And so, in as much as we came down from ancient Egypt in 8th century, when the Kush Kingdom took over uh, the took over Egypt and many other patterns, uh, standard patterns coming. So we still have this word. Like the fourth pharaoh of the ancient Egypt, the fourth pharaoh of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt, who ruled from 3000 BC to 2000, Naira 90 BC. His name was Atta. The title of Igala king is Atta Igala. The title was taken after him. Of course, in Igala, we have many titles that were taken after the names of people. For instance, we have Obaji. As a name, we also have Obaji as a title. We have Ogohi as a name, we have Ogohi as a traditional title. We have Amana, we have Odekina, we have Ashema, we have Anaja, like the Anaja of Ganaja or a Ganaja in Lokoja, now corrupted to a Ganaja. So all these are names, and today they are uh, traditional titles. So if we still retain some words from ancient Egypt in Igda, the headquarters of Igala Kingdom, or among the Igala people, then you should be able to retain the Igala words you have taken from here in Gula also. And that is why these few
few ones, I have prayed for you that you have still retained them. It is also good to know that Igala was not the only people that were taken to the Bola people. So you cannot expect to have 100% of Igala was because you will also uh, adopt other people's own as you continue to use. And so this is just the brief one. But again, moving further, of course, you are not in stone as the Olu Igala of Golan, Southern uh, Carolina General, not only shall I say. Now, this is in line with the mandate given to me or established by Agaba Ido, Idako Abelboni, the second, the Atangala who just went for hunting. He instructed me that this work of reconnecting his people must continue and that any community discovered in Nigeria, there must be a coordinator that I must appoint a coordinator on his behalf. And that is what we have been doing since 2014. Many communities or all communities discovered in Nigeria to be Igala, in Delta, in Edo, uh, Enugu, Ebony State, in fact, in the 29 states and FCT, including Nasarawa, they have coordinators. And so this is in line with the instruction given to me that I should employ them on his behalf. And in 2020, 15th uh, February, all these people, most of these coordinators, came with their people to attend the first and historic Igala National Congress that was hosted by Ata Igala, Ata Idapua Elboni, in his palace in Ida. And so, your installment as the Onu Igala was what he also told me. So when, when he says that all those in Nigeria should be given coordinators because they already have their own chiefs in their community or kings in their community, but all those we are going to get from outside, that any community I'm going to discover on its behalf from outside, outside Nigeria, must have Onu Igala. And so, the instruction given to me is the one I've been using. In as much as he went for hunting since August this year, the work continued because he gave me the instruction that I must continue. But in as much as he told me to continue, he gave me additional information. And that additional information is to install the shift or the head of any community discovered outside. And so, that power given to me by his spirit, by the Agabaidu, the Ataigala who just went hunting, that is Agabaidu, Idapo, Abemboni the second, whose spirit is still in me that I'm working with, you will install as the Onu Igala of Gala, Southern Carolina, USA. And you have the mandate of uniting, reconnecting, making peace. In, in dedication, in loyalty, and with very big hard work and with what you are doing now, that all our people, all the indigenous Egala people here, are one under the same umbrella of a united Egala kingdom. This is part of what you are going to do. There must be one. You are representing the Egala kingdom. You are representing the Atai Gala. You are representing the royal or the head or the prime minister of the Igala people. You are representing each and every one of us at home here in Ida or Kogi State, the ancestral headquarters of the Igala people. Your responsibility is very, very big. Hmm. Apart from uniting them and coordinating them in a very peaceful way, you are also to introduce or continue the various Igala cultures that we are doing here. They must start or must continue if they are here now. And those that are here that are not very effective in line with what you are doing, they are going to be put in the right perspective with the guidance of myself and my team members, as well as the spirit of Ata Ayeba, or my Yoko, who commenced all this unity work many centuries ago, as well as the Atta Idapu Amelboni, 
who re activated the recognition and the recognition of these people under one umbrella, the spirit is going to guide you in whatever you are going you are doing there. And so before any question, I still want to thank the Queen Mother for her role. And to the rest of you, the Queen Mother, I thank you once again. You are going to live long. You are going to live long. You are going to live long. The words I'm using for you is the voice of ancestors that told me. They said the one who is always doing well must always say well. She's not here. Be with you. God bless you all. Mepachaka, 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 Ojashi. 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 Thank you, Ambassador. Huh? Oh, uh, Ambassador, I, we, at, this, at this time I'd like to present, you have the letter? Uh, the letter of reconnection to Essence uh, on behalf of Atai Gala and yourself. Uh, so, would you, you want to hold that? In the name of God who's most gracious and merciful, in the name of Atai Gala and our great ambassador. You got it? Hold on one second. Let me just switch. Oh, flip the camera. Excuse me, Ambassador. Excuse me? Oh. Are, are, you, are you seeing the presentation? Or can you? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. And I will at this time present a letter of reconnection to our sister Essence. United Igala Peoples Network, indigenous Igala people and sister tribes across Nigeria and beyond, Atai Igala's palace, on behalf of the entire good people of Igala Kingdom, I, the Prime Minister of Igala Kingdom, and the Oshadu Oko Ata Igala, Ata of all Igala worldwide, write to officially reconnect with you, Essence Simmons of Charleston, South Carolina, USA, as one of our Gullah Igala sisters. With this, myself and all the people of Igala Nation across the globe henceforth recognize you as their sister. It is my greatest delight to have reconnected with you, and I look forward to seeing you visit the palace of Ata Igala in particular and Ida Koji State, Nigeria, the ancestral home of all Igala people soon. God bless you, Ambassador Ayagba Abdullahi Adojo. General Igala Ambassador of Ata Igala, President of the United Igala People Network. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Agba. 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 Now go, now Agba. go. <laughs> Very lovely. Thank you so much for this honor. It's it's such a pleasure, and I just want to see more and be able to learn and uh, open my heart to our people and reconnect. Now I go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Happy, happy you. 
Uh, thank you, Ambassador. At this time, um, we will close out. And uh, are there any parting words? Yeah, and, and uh, no question again, okay? Uh, are there any questions? Uh, did did y'all have any questions from the presentation? It was there any? There was no questions at this time. Um, and if uh, anybody contacts us, because I did get a call, if there are any questions that uh, that's relative to your presentation and to the kingdom, we will forward it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Facebook Live. That concludes the presentation for today. We appreciate you so, so very much for being here with us today. And would you like to close out the live ONU, our new ONU here locally in the Charleston, South Carolina area as we shut down the Facebook Live? You want any, any parting words? Uh, just that I thank everyone who uh, participated with us and who uh, visited with us. Um, I'm eternally grateful for your presence. I uh, implore that everyone make a careful investigation of those things that we've learned in this society. Um, we need to purge ourselves of those things that, that, do not, that do not elevate us and then cling hold to those things that will. And so uh, with that, I will uh, ask our Queen Mother if, she, if there's anything that she cares to share. And if not, uh, we will close up. Peace and love, my brothers and sisters, my family here in Charleston. And a special, special thank you to my families in Nigeria. I like to just say that this is a day that I have been waiting for. And I'm blessed to be a part of it. And I want to say that if you've been talking about nation building, this is the time to connect so that we could bring that to fruition here in Charleston through our Ogala connection with the Igala people of Nigeria. Now go, now go, now go, Ashe. And with that, again, uh, thank you for joining us. We are at 249 St. Philip Street. Uh, you can connect with us on uh, Instagram as well as Facebook, the African Redemptive Struggle Museum or ARS Museum. And uh, or Abba Nizar, just stay close, and we will be looking forward to more uh, uh, lectures and festivals as we go forth. Again, thank you. <laughs>